<laughs> Hello to everyone. It's so lovely to see you. Full house. This is absolutely wonderful. Whoever organised the weather on behalf of the farmers and school teachers in the area, thank you for a little bit of sunshine. We love that. We, is that going to be okay? Um, you could be decapitated by the Geelong, the Geelong Regional Library sign. Um, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Katrina Roundtree. Some of you may know me as a local, as a local girl who grew up there. Uh, well, married the farmer who grew up there, I, I should say. And of course, to begin our afternoon together, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land on which we stand for this beautiful library, the Wadawurrung and Eastern Ma people, and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Melissa Doyle. Hi. We should let you know we're beginning worried because it takes us half an hour to say hello to each other. <laughs> Clearly the two of us, um, we're chatterboxes. We, we, we love to listen to stories and tell stories. But of course, Mel and I have a few things in common. Obviously, we rock a side part like no one else. I mean, obviously, obviously that. I've had mine since I was two. Yes, <laughs> I've never I've changed it since. No choice, no choice. <laughs> um, secondly, Mel and I actually grew up minutes from each other. Uh, we, were, we were geographically blessed, certainly professionally. We, we were. We grew up on Sydney's North Shore and went to school there. So we were very close to head office, which, which was wonderful for us. We never really had to leave home to forge our careers, which that part you probably well know. Uh, we are both professional chatterboxes. Uh, we have made our passion our profession. So that is an absolute joy for the two of us. So once again, thank you so much for coming. We're just going to have a rave, if that's okay with you, as we talk about this amazing book. I think that for me, I have to say, Mel, as we chat about the book, which is about these eight extraordinary people and they have these epic tales each unto themselves that each are worthy of a movie just alone but for me I I emotionally would not be able to handle an hour 20 I would not be able to handle a full movie so thankfully Mel has been able to take their stories and and condense them and wrap them up in a bundle for us and as we agree and you will find out as you read the book there is there is such an uplifting tale at the end of each of their stories so thankfully we have the book to learn from but it begs the question how on earth did you get this down to eight interesting people how could you whittle it down after years and years of interviews Oddly enough, they all came together naturally. I felt as though each person, although their experiences and challenges are very, very different, in a way they all dovetailed with one another. There was a thread that would lead from one to the next. I did have another three that didn't make the book for a few different reasons, but these eight spoke to me. Um, in many ways. It was a project that I've spent quite a few years doing and it's, I've never worked on anything for so long in my life, particularly having done live television, you know, it's sure. done in an instant and then never watch it back. Um, and even on Sunday night, you might do a story that took a few weeks, but that was about it. So this has taken me a few years and it's interesting because every person in the book has touched my heart and my soul in a very different way and I think I just had this incredible handful of people and stories and they all just fitted and so yeah I don't really know if that answers your question but in my mind it just felt natural. The wonderful thing is that each and every one of you will be able to take something from this book. All ages are covered, all backgrounds are covered but Ultimately, for me, when I finished reading the book, I, I put the book down and I finished it at night and then the next day I called three people that 
I know are going through challenging situations. And I just called them to connect. I just called them to say hello. Thankfully, they were all fine, but just loved connecting and, and just the spontaneous phone call, just, just to call to see how you are. How did the book change yeah. your behaviour in a sense? Oh, great question. Before I answer it, can I just say, I think that's what we do as human beings is we connect. We share stories. You, How many times have you been to a dinner and sat down next to, all due, all due respect to the gentleman in the room, but it's such a female thing. You sit down next to a woman. By the end of the night, we walk out and I say to my husband, I tell him his, her whole life story. I've got everything. Like, we're best friends and we've known each other for two hours. And, you know... If you've had a tough day, what's the first thing you do? I ring my best friend and vent, or I ring my family. And, and I just think that's what we do. We, we share stories. We've done it since the beginning of time when we've sat around a campfire. I think that's one of the most powerful connections that human beings have. So, yeah, sharing all of those. And now I've totally forgotten what your question was that you asked me before I went on that random oh, rabbit hole. Lesson. Get used to it, because I do it a lot, and I'm really sorry. Yes, I'll keep you in line. <laughs> My question is that I learnt something. It changed my form of behaviour. It made me pick up the phone. It altered me. How did it alter you? It reminded me how incredibly strong humans are. It gave me perspective. I think that was a really important point for all of us. We, you know, it, the book was born in 2020 when life just was thrown upside down in so many ways for all of us in different degrees. I think there's not a single person that wasn't touched by change, by a challenge of some sort. You know, I lost my job. My eldest son packed up and moved overseas. We had to farewell him at the front door of the international terminal to go to university. I couldn't even walk into the gate and, you know, any parents in the room will know, but I just sobbed like a baby. Um, and, you know, life, there was a lot of things going on and, and my mother-in-law was in hospital at the time and, you know, it just felt like, and suddenly we're talking about a global pandemic and everything was just thrown upside down. And so, as a journalist, I did what I do, which is to tell stories and share stories. So, it was a really organic, natural project to work on and I felt at the same time it was helping me it was reminding me of perspective it was reminding me of what mattered and every person although in the book is so different and what they went through is so different the wisdom that I gained from all of them was a little bit different and I feel like hopefully a reader will take a little bit of something from each person and their story that might resonate and, you know, probably people will find different spots. You know, when you read a book and somebody finds a chapter or a paragraph that they dog ear that page to go back to, and it's quite different than the page that the next person will dog ear. So I feel like I took little bits from everybody that I shared their stories. Because I'm a professional, I dog eared my entire book. <laughs> I and love dog-eared books, well-worn dog red books. books. Like, you've got to love your book. <laughs> and I... Um, I didn't highlight it knowing that we were going to be chatting because I'm so ready to respectfully pass the book on. I've already spoken to three people. I'm like, okay, okay, I'll send you my copy. I'll say, oh, you're going to love it. You're going to love it. There's so much to learn from it. But, okay, I can open any one of my dog ears. And, um, okay, I'll just, I'll just read you this one here. Um, it's from Kat, and it's one thing that she teaches at Empowerment Ethos. We need to ask ourselves, what would I say or how would I care for my best friend? Self-compassion is doing that for ourselves. I thought that in itself was a really lovely concept as well. The importance of, I just said, first thing I did, I called friends. Are you okay? Is everything okay? But equally, you've got to check in with yourself. That was an important lesson too. I kind of liked... I never read the book from um, Eddie who survived the Holocaust and you were saying that you... you the happiest you man on earth. Yeah, yes. Eddie Jacker wrote that. Yeah, look, um, Kat Barlow is one of the most extraordinary women I've ever met and she has a beautiful little boy and Kat lives every day with this incredible view that every day is to be treasured, every experience is precious and I don't want to make her cry or me cry, but Kat is here in the room tonight with us, and so is Noah. So um, I'd love it if you could just all give them a shout-out, because Noah is a champion. 
Um, can can I we just, just give them a round okay? of applause? <laughs> Kat taught me so much, as did Noah, and Noah is actually the hero of this book because I named it because of Noah's amazing attitude. And this is really hard to say when you're here. And, and I don't want to look at you because I don't want to cry. <laughs> and he's so good looking. <laughs> he's so good looking. He's so good, good looking. looking. <laughs> it's almost difficult to look at a man that handsome. And he's so <laughs> talented. And he's on such a high because he said it was pouring with rain at school. And he loved it because tomorrow they might get to wear gumboots. So that's thrilling. And he said it was hysterical because he saw a boy at school run straight into a pole. And he said that was really funny. <laughs> <laughs> which is gorgeous, but of course, because they're here, but also apparently it is one of the most popular questions. Please, Mel, tell us how you got the name of the book, because the, the kid's right here. So Noah taught us that when you've got to face a challenge and things are a little bit difficult or it might hurt, Noah finds his 15 seconds of brave. And I know that sometimes... When, you, when it could go longer than 15 seconds, I believe there's another 15 seconds in there, but that's probably maxed out. You reckon that's about it? And I think I learnt so much that if Noah can find 15 seconds to be brave, then we all can. And I think that's the theme that I kept coming back to, was no matter how difficult things are, and as I said, they're all relative, and never for a moment will I compare somebody's challenges to somebody else's, because when it's yours and you're in it, it's the toughest thing and it's no relation to anybody else's and that is irrelevant. But when it's yours, it's yours. And I think we've all had those times where sometimes you just got to dig a little deeper than others. Um, and if it requires 15 seconds, then that's pretty amazing. Some of the people in this book, um, yeah, they, they really had to dig deep. So... It's interesting that you say that we all take different things from it because I owe Noah a debt of gratitude because today my son, who's the same age as you, they had their immunisation at school. I said, be like Noah, find your 15 seconds of brave. It's okay, there are going to be needles. It's all right, find that 15 seconds of brave. So I have you to thank for that, my darling, and of course you for being the conduit. We're talking about some of the people that are in the book. I am curious, a dramatically different story. I mentioned that you and I grew up in the same area and I'm sure that every single person in this room would agree. We unexpectedly won the postcode jackpot in life, the geographical jackpot in life. This is where we get to live. This is the community that we grew up in. Not everybody is blessed with that. You mentioned this book, it gives you perspective. Share with us a little of Grace's story who just happened to be born into war-torn Uganda. Grace was 12 years old when she was going to visit her grandmother and the car was hijacked by the Lord's Resistance Army and Joseph Coney and his, his um, soldiers. And she was abducted and forced to become a child bride at 12. She was married to Joseph Coney's 2IC, a warlord, who was, you know, in his late 30s, and given a gun and taught how to use a machine gun and a weapon and forced to spend five years traipsing around Uganda and into Sudan and being a soldier. Um, and it was that or die. And her story just makes me, you, you know, just can't believe yeah, the words I, I, on the page. It's horror, and it's interesting because there's a lot in her story that I didn't cover in the book. I was very respectful. It's her story, and there are clearly things that you know nobody should talk about. And if she chooses to, then you know, or not. So. Grace is incredible because now she works, she now lives in Australia and she works with severely disabled children as part of the NDIS and her heart is bigger than this entire room. And she lives by this mantra where she says, I choose to be happy. And she talks about she had no control over what happened to her. She had no control over what happened to her life and those teenage years. And even now, she's very open that she struggles. Some days are good and some days are dark. And she says, I choose to be happy. 
And if a woman who has been through what she has been through has that mindset to control her feelings and how she chooses to be, that to me is so powerful. Yeah. It's one thing to say it, but to have her experiences and to live it, I thought you really know what you're talking about and I will listen. And without blowing the end of the stories, I felt that of all our eight individuals, um, I felt there was something so uplifting about each of our remarkable stories and that's why I loved the book. I found the silver lining which you pointed out. I'm curious though, as a writer, there's an element that you have to do where, uh, for legal reasons, to make sure that your facts are correct, that you then have to go back to that person who's just really spilled their stories to you, really cathartically, probably, possibly enjoyed the experience in a way, get it off their chest, almost in a therapeutic way. But then you have to go back before the book is published and go, could you please read back this story? I need to make sure it's factually correct, that you're happy with it. This book has a point of difference. What was that like for you to have to do that? I've, even if I didn't have to do it, I would have done it because I'm telling people's stories. It's very different as a journalist when you're covering an event, a news event. I've covered so many significant moments of history that have been incredible, but standing in a place talking about something that's going on is so different than telling somebody's soul and heart and life and my sense of responsibility was the thing that drove me more than anything I wanted everybody in the book to read it because I wanted to I wanted to ensure that I I treated their stories truthfully and respectfully and I honored each and every one and that they were comfortable I'd hate somebody to have a moment where they go oh I wish I hadn't shared quite so much mm. Grace and Tonya in the book both said to me they struggled to reread their chapter, and I did say, look, I, I, you know, I don't want to force you by any means, but I just do want you to skim it to ensure that you're happy before it goes out into the world. Julie is in here. She's a woman who is recovering um, from alcoholism. She found the process quite cathartic. It was really interesting. Some people wanted just to share and it all came gushing out. Some of the other interviews took a long time. I did a number of interviews over, you know, an 18 month period where sometimes we'd have a, a date scheduled to chat and, um, you know, Aurelio, for example, would say, look, sorry, darling, I just can't do it today. I'm not in the best place. Or Grace would say to me, I've got to work tomorrow, so I can't chat tonight because knowing that it would take her down a dark tunnel and she knew that she just needed a few days to, once she spoke about things, she'd had, a, had to have a couple of days to just regather herself. So my duty of care to everybody in the book was the primary driver in every word that I wrote to be the conduit to share their stories. I feel incredibly humbled that they trusted me. Mm. And so I took that trust very seriously. You know, it's, it's, I, I didn't, it's not about me. It's, it's not, I didn't write it for me. I wrote it for the people in the book and I wrote it for the people that will read it that probably need to hear some of these stories in the hope that it will give them some strength and encouragement and yeah, a little bit of, little bit of courage because we probably all need it right now. I thought it was really interesting how the stories came to you. you when I asked you the first question, how would you pick eight? How would you whittle it down? It's so interesting that through the course of your life, not just through your television work, these interesting characters have passed through your life, yet also the point of difference. You've had the antenna up to listen and to be perceptive enough and to pick up on that story. I know for Grace that came through your work with World Vision. I think that for, for Yuli that came through your husband's job that you developed a girl crush on this amazing woman. I was just intrigued. How did the stories come to you? Some of them are people that I'd interviewed over the years and I have this habit that there are particular people that I've met through work that I keep. It's a really hard thing to do an interview, particularly with a television camera, and ask somebody to talk about the most traumatic thing they've ever been through and then button off and walk out. You know, I just, I can't do that. So there are some people that I have kept. Um, there are people in the book that I was really 
I guess for want of another word, intrigued to know how they were doing mm. years later. And also with the hindsight, so Kat and I first met when I interviewed you maybe 10, not quite 10 years ago, 10 years ago, um, Tonya, I interviewed for Sunday night a few years ago. Tonya's story is her horrific. She, her father was murdered, which is awful in itself, and her daughter was then charged and found guilty. So Brittany had murdered her own grandfather, and Tonya just lost everything she knew in her life. Her dad, her daughter, her marriage broke down, everything just imploded. And her story is remarkable that I saw, I, in, I first interviewed her probably a year after all of that had happened and she was still so incredibly broken. And I just had always stayed in touch and I wanted to revisit her and her story to know that a few years later where she was at primarily, but what she had learnt and what she could see with the benefit of hindsight got her through. Um, she's remarkable. She's so honest and I've... I've tried with all of these for people to be really, they're really truthful and honest that there are messy bits. We get to the hope at the end of each story. So I do want you to know that, that it's positive and everybody has got to this place that they are so remarkably and strong, but everyone's real about it. That not every day do you wake up and there's roses blooming in the garden and puppy dogs jumping over rainbows. You know, it just doesn't happen that way. And Tonya is remarkable that she talks about getting through the messy bits and what she had to do and her therapist reminding her to have a shower and actually get dressed and do those really basic things. And one of the things, I don't want to give it all away, but one of the things I love is Tonya then decided to go back to the place in her life where she was becoming Tonya, which was her teenage years. So she would play all the, her favourite 80s music on repeat, which mentally took her back to where she was when she was 15, 16, 17, growing up, discovering who she was. And that also then, it's almost like she rebooted herself, if that's a way to term it, and started it again. And, and I just found that really beautiful because it was so simple, yet so vital, and it, it worked for her. So she's a remarkable woman. I wanted to ask you about a term that we both learned, as did Tonya, that we were unaware of, but something that you mentioned, you said because you were interviewing them for a book, they had the, the breadth of time, you had the ability to put off an interview such a different way to interview that you would be conditioned to rather than boom, boom. Uh, you got, we got three minutes, you need to get to the heart of it straight away, I need to instantly befriend you so that we can deliver to the TV audience, even more so in your case because it's live. Was that a silver lining in a sense for you? Yeah, and as you know better than anyone, the art of an interview is a conversation. Sometimes you go in with your questions and where you think it might go, and it's a totally different direction. And to me, that's the beauty in it. And by having the time to do a number of interviews with these people, I, I things came up that I hadn't expected. I found us going down paths that I hadn't known about or exploring areas that weren't necessarily on my list of questions, but we went there in a really natural way. Or I'd do the interview, and I did most of them over Zoom so that I could translate them and... Um, transcribe them, sorry, um, and then write them up. And then it was often when I was reading it again that I'd pick up little bits that I'd missed that time in the conversation because I was either crying my eyes out or thinking about where we were going next. So, yeah, it was a lovely... It's really different from television. And Be also they yeah. didn't have to worry about how they looked. Yes. And the difference, I think, between not having a whopping great camera in your face and all the lights and a whole crew, um, you know, I felt people were able to hopefully, relax a little bit more. But in a way, it was more challenging for me. I had to learn television. You rely on, obviously, talent and facial expressions, and sometimes what you don't say says so much. And all of a sudden, I had to fill all those blanks in with words. I couldn't just leave big chunks of space on a page like in television you would have. So um, it was a little bit more challenging in some ways for me, but I also think it let me delve into areas that I might not have. Yes. Because... 
in TV, you need pictures and you have to colour in and you'd write a script and you have to overlay that with, with imagery. And there's a lot of things that we talk about in the book that you wouldn't want, you couldn't put pictures over. Yes. And so it was a really different experience. It was a whole new learning experience And, and wonderful. Yeah. And wonderful. Here you are stepping into this new world. We mentioned silver linings that we've come through over the last few years. You know, to have that joy of using your talent to allow people to be comfortable and to open up. Um, I, I, I would, of course, love to ask you a few questions about, about, about you as well, because as you mentioned, the book is not about you. But I, I do also want to ask about the one family, the chapter that had me in tears. Can you guess? Yeah, I had to do the audio book and I was in tears again, so... Uh, yeah, Danny's me, story. It was Danny. Yeah. Oh, it was Danny. Yeah. And it gives me tears and chills mm. just to talk about it right now. Please share with us a little bit about one of your eight, uh, a man named Danny. The story we all know, but yeah. not in the layers that you revealed in the book. You might remember from 2020, there was a horrific crash in Sydney where a drunk, drug, drugged driver crashed into a group of children and the Abdullahs lost three of their children and their beautiful niece. And they just went out to get ice cream. Yeah, and, and, you know, you just can't fathom it. And Layla, his wife, came out the next day and said she forgave the driver. And I think every single one of us probably had that same reaction where we just went, oh, did I hear that right? Layla is a remarkable woman. She's deeply religious and her faith is what's given her strength and got her through. But Danny intrigued me. Danny grew up in the wild Western Sydney gangs where he was a boxer, he was tough. Vengeance was the code that he and his mates lived by. He was naughty. He was naughty. I had no idea. And so on the night of the crash when the children were in hospital, those that had survived, um, all the guys that he grew up with were at the hospital ready to go in and get revenge on the driver and Danny was the one that called them off. They had the riot squad there and he, and he called them off. And he said a line to them. He said a line, I've dog-eared it. He said yeah. a line, when, when you go after someone with revenge, dig yourselves two graves, one for yourself, oh, one, one for the person that you're taking the revenge out on and one for yourself. That was just such a simple line that he told to his mates who were after blood on that night. That resonated with me so much. I thought that was fantastic. And, and you know, such an interesting layered man to then reach that point where he said, we forgive the driver. And, you know, I'll be honest, I don't think I could. And the reasons why he did it, and, and he said that they could not spend the rest of their life so consumed by hatred and anger and vengeance. He said that... The, the thing he said to me that got me the most, he said th three of their children lost three of their siblings on that day. He didn't want them to lose their parents as well by the path that they could have gone down with hatred. And so we talk a lot about forgiveness and why and also the point being it's one thing to say it, it's another thing to actually walk the talk, mm -hmm. to, to live it and to do it. And they do. And they've started the most remarkable charity called I Forgive. And they have an annual day that is about raising awareness and a little bit like a number of people in this book mm. who've then used their experiences. Like cat. cat. Exactly. To empower others to talk about their experiences. Aurelio, who talks about his mental health battle, in the beginning he was so worried that people would find out. Now he's this most incredibly outspoken mental health advocate who talks openly about what he's been through in the hope that it can help other people. So the power that comes from using someone's experience to use it for good, to advocate, to, you know, bang on the doors and bang on the drums and get people noticing. And I think when someone talks about forgiveness, to have that person be Danny Abdullah, you sit up and listen. Mm. Equally, another lesson in the book, a problem shared is a problem halved. I can't remember who said that, but it's almost like a concept that comes through from all, all of our eight characters, our eight individuals in this story. I just wanted to quickly touch on that term that I wanted you to explain that we hadn't heard before that's rotten, 
and you, you wish that you didn't know about it, but Tanya definitely learnt it, ambiguous grieving. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I didn't know because, I mean, you know, grief is grief, but as we know, there are many different forms. She talks about amb ambiguous grief when it's not clear-cut and, and the ambigu ambiguity of, of grieving a father who was murdered in such a horrific way and then she grieves her daughter who's in jail, who's still alive, but she is grieving the relationship, she's effectively grieving that loss of trust, that, that bond, all of those things. As I was, you know, doing the deep dive into research that, you know, a lot of people that have a loved one with dementia, it's something they experience because you still have them, you still love them, but you're grieving, the relationship is different, that person mm. is different. So, and I think, uh, you know, I don't want to make it sound flippant in any way, but I think that reflects the last few years for a lot of people. A lot of people are grieving different things, grieving a former life, grieving, you know, how they used to be. Uh, so much has changed and I think it's really important we acknowledge it and mm. we let it happen, we sink into it, you know, I think... One of the other, sorry to move on, but one of the other it's stories... It's my next in question, <laughs> Mel. <laughs> probably is. <laughs> Rachel, in this book, is um, her now husband lost his legs in Afghanistan. Um, and I talked to her about what happens when something happens to the person that you love. It's one thing if it happens to you and you have to keep going, but what when it, what when it is the person that you love? How do you help them? How do you navigate through it? for them. Mm. And Rachel talks about suffering a degree of PTSD. She's a doctor and she didn't acknowledge it for so long. She kept saying, but I didn't, it wasn't me, I didn't lose my legs, it was Kurt. But clearly she has lost, you know, their future has changed. She saw the person that she loved change, their relationship has changed. And, I, and that, that made me realise that how much we need to remember that we're all affected when something you know last week we were in Lismore and and you know you they've been through hell with flood after flood after flood and even the people that not necessarily have lost their homes but they're part of the community they're mm. grieving they're feeling it mm. they're going through all of the emotions and they have to and they have to be allowed to feel that and I think sometimes we have that stoic moment where it's like well if it didn't happen to me then you know I'm okay well no that's not always the case Mel I have to say I did actually have a conversation with my husband this morning about mourning uh, hopes lost dreams uh, that have not been fulfilled I have to prepare him if my son does not continue to play soccer like my husband is the biggest soccer mom it's embarrassing and I was like listen if it doesn't work out you're going to have to mourn those dreams. <laughs> you may not be going to the World Cup with him. Like, I just need to prepare you. I learned about that in the book. Well, you have to learn to fake it till you make it. That's the other <laughs> thing. So Nick, our son, moved to America in 2020. <laughs> and, you know, you spend your whole life getting them ready to fly the nest. And then when they do, it's like, oh, sugar, I forgot to get myself ready. Yes. And we bawled our eyes out for weeks. And even now, you know, he talks about, hoping to get a job over there when he graduates and you know part of me is so proud of him and I want the world for him and I want him to fly and do everything but I also just want him to come home so I think there's that sense of you know we get on the whatsapp and we're all smiling and we're so happy for him and then we hang up and John and I just look at each other and go <laughs> So, fake it till you make it. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about the concept of change because it's a selfish question in a sense. I know so many of us in this room right now and who are listening in our own different ways, we've gone through change. Um, unfortunately for you, you've had a little bit of salt added on top because you've gone through change publicly. But I did just want to ask, as a mum, as a woman, as someone that um, has not even so much a, a public profile, but I'm just curious, how have you been able to navigate change and what's your advice to others there for you? I've always tried to have the attitude of embrace it. I think change is good. I think change is healthy. I think change shakes us up. You know, you can get in a rut and I think it's a good thing. I've loved having changes throughout my career and trying new things. I like to challenge myself. I like learning. I love nothing more than going to a country that I don't know very much about and I'm open-minded and I learn. I'm that 
weirdo that goes to a restaurant and will order something that I've never had before and don't even know what it is. I like... I think change is a really good thing. Mm. Yeah, there are moments that it's a little challenging and we can rely on what we know and what is comfortable and it can be a bit wobbly. It can also be hard when everyone's got an opinion and they all weigh in, but I do try to cut out the noise. Never read the comments. I never read the comments. So I try not to take that on board. As long as I know what I've done and why I've done things, then I'm okay with that. But I think it's actually a really healthy thing. Everybody in every industry, in every career, throughout their lives, changes jobs, and moves around, does different things. So I don't know why there's always such a spotlight when somebody in television does it, like we're the only ones in the world. You know, you go, hello, like every teacher at school probably moves around or changes roles and classes and yeah, people do it, it's normal. I think there's an element that everybody can relate to in a sense what you may be experiencing publicly, being a half empty nester, uh, changing jobs sometimes against your choice. Everyone can relate to those elements as well. That in turn is your your gift as well. You just happen to be a very personable person. Um, I want to selfishly ask a question possibly for anyone that's here and who may be listening. I thought, Mel, if if it was us, when we were starting out in our careers, I mentioned that, that we both um, grew up in a, in a similar place, loving sharing stories. Um, you were in community radio as well. I saw that I was in community radio, loved community radio. She was someone, so much better at it than I was, though. No, but, you yeah. know, someone goes, can you talk for four hours? Hello. <laughs> Only four, she says. <laughs> Only four. And I want to ask the question for the journalism student that may be listening to this, for maybe someone that, that wants to get into writing a book or, or would like to possibly have a career that's, that's as magnificent as yours for all of its lovely colours and, 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 and experiences. What, what do you think has, has made you uh, stand out in a sense? Because uh, you, you went, to the, went to university, we, we did the journalism course, you've reached the top of the tree. What, what, what do you think is that, that little je ne sais quoi? I still pinch myself and my dad still keeps a scrapbook. Um, which is really lovely. Um, in the beginning, I will say it was hard work and it was perseverance and just keep going and have initiative and this is going to completely age me, but I remember being in third year and having a list of all the names of every news director pretty much around the whole country and trudging down to the public phone box in the main street of Bathurst with my bag of coins and ringing them all every week and annoying them until one finally went, oh, odd, okay, come for a job interview, and, and I got my first interview. So I think there was an element of that. But as I've got older, I've recognised, and I think this is applicable in any field, and it doesn't even matter what you do, is work out who you are and own it. And I remember for many years looking at other journalists and thinking, oh, I just want to be like them and admiring what they do. And it took me a long time to recognise what I could do, what made me tick, what made me, um, you know, what my values are, what my priorities are, what the stories I want to tell. And I just think, now that I look back, I wish I'd known that earlier. And sometimes, you know, I remember the first time I cried on air, I was mortified because it was so unprofessional. But now I think... We loved it. But now it I'm like... It real. was real, yeah. And I'm really glad I still cry on air because I think for a start, the second I stop means I'm so hardened that I probably need to go do something else. But I, I had that moment of going, you know what? Okay, I am soft and I do have a particular style, but that's who I am. So take it or leave it. And if whoever I might be working for at the time doesn't want that, that's okay. That's not what they want. This is who I am, and if you don't want it, then maybe I'll do something with it over here. And I, I, you know, flipping this back on you, but I look at you, and that's we know who you are, we know what you do well, and you glow, and you've always been you. And I just think no matter what you do, you've just got to be you. And I know that probably sounds a little bit like a cliche, but I really think it's true that that you know, I always say to my kids, we're all cogs in a wheel. We're all necessary. We're all, we all need to be part of that wheel to make it go around. Um, but 
just, yeah, you're a little different to the next cog, so that's okay. Be proud of it and own it. I will open the questions up to the floor in just a moment if, if you would like to ask Mel any particular questions. But I, I guess uh, because I'm holding the mic right now, I do just get to finish up on, on one question and, and, and that is, of course, all the silver linings that, that you have been able to learn over the last few years uh, culminating in this inspiring, beautiful book. I'm curious, what are you excited about for your future as, as you go from one adventure to the next, one challenge, met head on, deal with it <laughs> onwards? What's, what are you excited about for your future with your beautiful husband? and? Because, yeah. you know, your children are old. I know. Well, one's left home, as you know. Um, I'm excited about the things that I don't know about yet. I'm excited by... I think I've always tried to remain open-minded to see what might come my way, what doors might open that I hadn't expected. And sometimes it's by walking through those unexpected ones that I've had the most incredible adventures. And so I feel so lucky. You know, sometimes it's right place at the right time. That's okay, but sometimes it's also being open-minded enough to just go for it. Um, but I love telling stories, however that might be, whether it's on television and This Is Your Life, whether it's in print, radio, just the, we've talked about this, the power of connection. You know, I just think it is so wonderful and I just want to keep telling stories um you know already in my mind going oh can I do another one and are there more you know they're just I, I love being humbled by the people that I meet and what they've done and experienced it and being that conduit being that person that gets to you know hold the megaphone up for them and say okay I'm just gonna if the world needs to know about you the world needs to know about Kat and what she's doing so I'm just going to put pen to paper so that you can all find out that's, you know, pretty special job. And I suppose, Noah, you would agree with what Mel has just said. Just, you know, stepping into each adventure and having an open mind and who knows the gifts that you can bring to others because I'm so glad that Mel shared your story because I personally learned so much from it. I know everybody will. And, and do you agree that, that life's an adventure? Just, just see what happens. Well, it's been a joy that you could join us and for everybody else as well. Now it's your turn. Would anybody like to ask a particular question? Just just put your hand up in the air. Uh, we can bring Mike to you if you like. Or me, if you like. I can tell you that my farmer is doing well. He's, he's on the paddocks tonight. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thanks for being the first one. Hello. Hi. Um, both of you are beautiful and it's been lovely listening to you both chat, so thank you for that. Mel, when you wrote the book, what, what were you hoping people would feel the most? I mean, we've, you've spoken a lot about their stories and their bravery, but once it was finished and you got it in your hand and you looked at the cover and you were proud of it, what were you hoping that we would feel as readers once we read it? Hope. Hope that we can all... We, to remind us that we will get through it. And when I say get through it, you know, whatever people might be challenged with is different and the outcome might be different than they were expecting. The ending might not be what they anticipated, but, you know, we, we heard the term new normal a lot over the last few years, which I'm sure you're like me, I got really sick of and I made sure Along I didn't put pivot. it. Along with pivot. Pivot, never want to hear that Throw again. Throw that off the balcony yeah. right now, that um, Chloe in this book taught me that. Chloe was a young woman. She was skiing in Italy and she broke her neck and she came home and life was very, very different. She's suddenly a quadriplegic in a, in a, in a chair. She continues to work. Um, she was in love and her dream was to be a mother. And I first met her doing a story on Sunday night when she became a mother. And it was that she, I think, puts it so beautifully where she says, you know, my future's different. Everything about me is different. You know, a new relationship with her own body. But she's still her. She still has the same dreams. Her life is still in front of her. It just looks different. 
and I think that, you know, some of the people in this book are a little bit, you know, Aurelio says he's gone from being this incredible fashion designer. He had to find his new identity and he talked about the fact that he'd been Aurelio Costarella, the fashion designer, all his career. Who is he now? Who is he today? How does he introduce himself? And so just redefining ourselves. So I think probably a very long way of answering your question. But, yeah, I think hope is the main thing and that sense of of courage and maybe sometimes redirection, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a negative. You know, it can be a positive, it's just different. And how do we find that? I would imagine from Aurelio's story, you would have taken so much from that as he's revealing his his lessons, the lessons that he's learned. And you mentioned throughout the book a few times as well um, that through no choice of your own, you also had to learn, well, who am I? How I'm... I don't want to be defined by by being melancholy yes. for 25 odd years. Who am I? How do I redefine myself and how do I push through? And also, it's not just in your own eyes, it's other people's eyes. And so, you know, so many people talk about that, that they are very different. Tonya, you know, says she's different to herself but she's also different to those around her. And she mentions that, you know, she'd always been Tonya the mother, Tonya the wife. Suddenly she was no longer identified in that way and who, who is she? And she felt she really had to start again and find out who the next incarnation of Tonya is. So, it, yeah, I think it resonates with all of us in, in different ways. You know what's interesting? I also have to add, when you talk about the desire for the book, it... I think ended up also being something entirely different to what you started out with because the book is also a tool, I think, in, in the sense, you know, I mentioned that Noah mentions this line, just finding his 15 seconds of brave. I talk to my children about that. I mean, I'm sure, Noah, when you said that line to your mum and your mum said that line to Mel and it was put into a book that you never in your life expected me to be encouraging my little boy using your words and your lesson as well. And then we also said, there are some people that might need this book for Christmas that maybe <laughs> you can't say certain things and you go, I think you might learn something <laughs> from this. It, it's a little bit serendipitous in that way, isn't it, Mel? Yeah. Um, and as you say, it, the book started off very differently. I started writing it at the beginning of 2020 when I was just the whole concept of change was intriguing me because I was approaching my 50th birthday and everyone kept saying to me, how do you feel about it? I was like, what do you mean how do I feel about it? Like, it's a birthday, I don't feel anything. And suddenly I thought maybe I should be feeling something. Anyway, I, I wanted to write a book about change and navigating change and then suddenly in what felt like two minutes, the world changed and so the book took on a bigger meaning for me but I also recognised at that point I just had to go deeper. I didn't want it to be light and fluffy and frivolous. And I, you know, I don't know about you, but sometimes those stupid inspirational calendars that have pretty pictures of puppies in daisy fields and tell you that, you know, things will get better and the sun will come up, it just didn't cut it. And I, and I wanted it to be real so that we could relate and I personally learn so much more when people are telling their truth. And so, yeah, the book kind of evolved into what it became. So I really hope it does help. It also gives a resonance to, um, to life's lessons as well because I have to go back when, when you said that Grace mentioned her ethos now is, I choose to be happy. Well, we've all seen on coffee cups choose happiness and we've seen that on on the calendars on the posters but when that girl says it whoa it takes on a whole new resonance to to what she has gone through and and for me as I say I just found so many silver linings from from the stories that that were shared um, were there any other questions oh great <laughs> thank you for coming <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm just curious, is there any plans or are there any plans to take the book to another dimension and turn it into a documentary, interviewing the... the yeah, it's funny you say that. I actually would love to. I would love to make it 
into television one day, I think, whether it's a documentary, whether it's a series. I think You've already got your eight Fs. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's a series. I don't, I don't know if everyone in the book would want to go on telly, but that's okay. We can, we can find more. But I, I feel it's that time in our... It's that moment in time where we need these... I need these stories, so I'm assuming I'm not the only one. And, you know, I, I love when I... I, you think of some of the most incredible movies that have got you and they're the chariots of fire where at the end that song comes up and you walk out of there going, yes, you know, the world is extraordinary and we can do this. I want to feel that. And I think there are so many people around us everywhere that can give us that feeling. So, a yes, if I could make it into a, a series where you watch those stories and feel that at the end then I'd love to do that would you be yeah. up for it Noah of course you would <laughs> episode one episode done. one beginning with the superstar <laughs> uh, just quickly ask any other questions because I, I know that I have a couple of thank yous of course uh, to Penguin uh, the publisher thank you so much and also to Warn Ponds Dimmix uh, who are selling the book here this evening as well I also have to say a little debt of gratitude to this library and to Geelong Regional Libraries like many people I grew up uh, going to my local library, but it wasn't until I became a mum and all of the different opportunities and um, uh, groups, I suppose, that our local library in this area offers to families and to individuals. So I went back and I think we had playtime with the books in the library and we had this crazy librarian who would read the stories in funny voices and my children would go wild and they could eat in the library and then cut to me befriending my librarian and I'd go off on getaway trips and I'd say, right, I'm going to Russia, where am I going? She'd get me eight books on Catherine the Great and Zars, so that was why I very much wanted to be here with Mel so that I could have the opportunity to say thank you so much to all of our local libraries, but particularly our Geelong Regional Libraries. And to bring it back to you, thank you so much for, for going with that constant love that you have of being the conduit to share other people's stories. That is something that, that we share and we adore. And so many people will be smiling after reading this book. So thank you so much to Mel Doyle, to our beautiful Noah and Kat who are joining us as we celebrate the launch of 15 Seconds of Brave. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Mel Doyle. And I want to say, of course, thank you to Geelong Library for having us here. This is extraordinary. I could just sit out on that deck, if you don't mind, for the next three days. It's magic. Um, but thank you to Katrina for doing this. You are wonderful. You are gorgeous from the inside. It just glows. And I love what you do. I admire and respect. But thank you for sharing this and making me feel comfortable. I don't like being on this side <laughs> of the interview. <laughs> Much rather be asking the questions. So thank you for making it fun. Thank you for giving up your evening and coming along. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you very much for joining us, guys. Speak to you soon. Enjoy 15 Seconds of Brave.